Good morning, church family and friends. And again, we welcome you to this online gathering of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Our isolation has gone on long enough now that we're beginning to form new habits, uh, even here in our weekly worship. Habits that I pray will not be much longer. Well, we certainly wouldn't compare our situation with the Israelites in exile. I'm starting to have an appreciation for the Psalms that reflect a desire to be with God's people in his house once again. Indeed, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. No doubt you too are longing to be with your brothers and sisters again, even as uh, your staff wants to see your faces and all that are up here this morning would really desire to see your faces worshiping out there with us today. But we also recognize that this is in God's providence and in God's sovereign plan, and that he is working his perfect will out during these times and in these circumstances. And so for the time being, we will continue in these new habits. So if you haven't already, take a moment to download or print the worship guide so that you can better worship uh, along today. And then again, there are two other resources that we'll point you to, as we have been doing now each week, First is a link uh, that is available for a digital attendance form. So we would encourage you to fill that out and feel free to use that also as a means of sharing prayer requests with the pastoral staff. Secondly is a link uh, for online giving. And this is the way uh, now that we are able to bring our tithes and offerings into the Lord's house uh, by giving online um, weekly. And of course, you can mail those in as well as another option uh, that we want to encourage you to do as well. So make that your offering of what God has blessed you with and even your offering of yourselves uh, as you do that. Uh, feel free to do that at the conclusion of the service so that the service is not interrupted for you. Your church staff continues to work and plan during these times. So again, be sure to look for communications that will be coming out from us in regard to what we know is going on around here and um, how we might better serve you as a staff uh, in your efforts to continue to worship, uh, to connect, to grow and serve here at St. Andrews. And again, thank you for your continued ministry to us as we strive to serve the Lord in these times. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm number 96, verses seven through 10. We'll read this responsively, so I'll invite you to join me now uh, and read the part of the people. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let's join together now in singing a hymn of triumphal procession. Lead on, O King Eternal. Thanks for 
Let's pray together. Well, Lord our God, we do profess that we know you to be the eternal king. And we are so grateful that you are, are not a king that rules with an, a cruel iron fist, but instead you are one that rules lovingly with all wisdom with tenderness, and with grace. And so, Lord, today we give you all praise, and we ask that you yourself would bless this time of worship, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many churches uh, down through the centuries have uh, much in common in terms of what we believe. And right now in our country, certainly, churches that believe the Word of God have so much in common in terms of our common experience. But the thing that binds us is our knowing the true and the living God. Down through the centuries, we have used the Apostles' Creed to profess that faith in answer to the question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer together. O oh Lord, we magnify your name with thanksgiving. Thank you that you hear the needy and you will not despise your own people. Thank you for what you're doing through our circumstances even now, as hard as they can be, as hard as they are. You are working for our good and fulfilling your purpose for us. Father, for many of us, these days have reminded us of our blessings, and they've also reminded us of our idolatry and sin. But even for this, we praise you, for you say in your word, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. Father, we do confess our sins to you. For the times we have been frustrated and angry with you. For the idols we've relied upon and inquired of rather than you. For the times in which we've acted as though we were self-sufficient and independent, and for the times we've been anxious but didn't pray. Forgive us, O oh Lord. We turn to you, Father, in the abundance of your steadfast love. Would you answer us in your saving faithfulness according to the abundance of your mercy? Build your church, Lord Jesus. We know the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Bring people into your kingdom. Enroll them as citizens of the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem. People from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Use St. Andrews to accomplish your purposes here in the community and around the world. And Lord, we do think of our missionaries who are serving abroad. Lord, would you protect them? Would you use them? Cause them to bear fruit for your namesake. 
Lord, revive our hearts. For we know that that is what you desire. For us to rend our hearts and not our garments. To love you from the heart, not to merely go through the motions. We pray for your protection, both physically from this virus and spiritually as we are at war. Give us victory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join now together in a hymn of confession, uh, a favorite of the churches throughout many centuries. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, son of God and son of man, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory joy and crown.
O our Father, we give you thanks and praise for sending the fair one of heaven, your only son, to come and bring salvation to our world, to make what was lost beautiful again, for only he could do this on our behalf. And so we thank you and we praise you for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. In response to this greatest of all gifts, take now our tithes and offerings and our lives and use them for this beautiful one's kingdom, we ask in his name. Amen. As you know, it's customary uh, following the scripture reading that our pastor prays a prayer of illumination, a prayer in which he asks God and the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to us through his word. But we too now have an opportunity to join in a corporate prayer of illumination, asking the Holy Spirit, asking the Lord to speak to us as we receive the food of his holy word. Let's pray together in song.
Let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians 2. And uh, while you're turning there, I, I have had the, uh, the high privilege, and I do consider it a high privilege, of preaching at a number of ordinations of, of those going into the ministry uh, throughout my ministry. And uh, I just consider that an enormous uh, privilege. And I've never, uh, either on Sundays or at those kinds of things, I've never preached the exact same message twice. I always rework a message, uh, update it, uh, redo things in, in every single message. Uh, but this passage that we have before us today is one that I have used several times uh, at the ordination services when I've been asked to preach. And the reason is that in this passage, uh, what we see is Paul addressing uh, something that is a, perhaps a temptation, perhaps a tendency for those in, in ministry, not just pastors, but but all of us as believers, and that is a, a tendency toward uh, a feeling of self-sufficiency. And a couple of things. One would be, in that would be too high of a view of our own ability or too low of a view of how much we need God. So I want you to keep that in mind as I as I read this passage, we're going to pick up with verse 12 of 2 Corinthians 2. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient? For these things. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's bow together. Lord, we thank you again that. Uh, your word is truth, and because of that we can trust it, and because it's from you, we know that it applies to us because you know us better than we know ourselves. And so help us as we look at this passage, will you cause your spirit uh, to be our teacher and give us hearts submissive to you and minds submissive to your will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I want us to, to look at uh, the Christian's walk and ministry. And by way of background to that, I want us to think about what Paul says about that. And then we're going to get to uh, this passage. Because Paul does have a take on the Christian's walk and ministry. Uh, earlier in this same book, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul said this, uh, verse 8, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Now, he's talking about a, a burden and an affliction 
here. And some versions might say that the agony of it, and, and that's the root of, uh, of, of those words there. Uh, I'm not going to spend time uh, talking about any challenges that have to do uh, with ministry. There are difficult things that uh, one deals with when they are in ministry, but that's not different from the rest of life, or it's not different from other vocations. There are always going to be difficult things. And to me, the vast portion of ministry has been a, a joyful and uh, a, just a, a wonderful experience. So I want us to hear, though, what Paul says. Remind us what, what Paul says. He talks about this affliction, this agony, um, this burden. And then over in Philippians 3, he talks about actually some, some loss of, of those things that he had accumulated in this world by way of reputation and so on. But I, I want you to be reminded, Philippians 3, verse 7, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. So that's, that's the bottom line of how Paul dealt with these afflictions, these agonies, any loss that he had, uh, he compared it to the gain of knowing Christ, and he understood it, gave him a perspective that if you gain Christ, you've lost nothing. And that's his focus there. Now again, now let's go to uh, our passage before us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of work our way backwards in the passage in terms of the order of the verses, but they all uh, very much fit together, of course. Uh, the one thing that we see here is that the, in terms of ministry, in terms of being representatives of Christ, the task before us is too much for us. The task before us is too much. In uh, chapter 2, verse 15, he says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Verse 16, To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? So what he's doing here is he is taking a picture that would be familiar to those that would be reading this. And it would be a, a, a picture of the Roman uh, triumphant procession, uh, this big parade, as it were, but it'd be a, a, a victory parade. And there were many of those whenever they would conquer and he's, he's comparing that to our walk with, with uh, Christ. So what was this Roman triumphal procession or uh, triumphus as it was called? There is a victory and what would take place is that the, the people in the city would line up. There'd be a processional route in the city of Rome all the way to the, the temple of Jupiter. And uh, there you would have uh, the captives. Those who had been conquered would be in chains and being taken down the street. You would have the soldiers, uh, the troops who were victorious, and they would be being celebrated. And then you would have uh, the victorious general, and he would be oftentimes in a gold chariot. And so he would really be uh, the focal point in that. So you get the picture of, of this parade going forth. Now, he mentions in these verses the, the aroma 
uh, the fragrance. Uh, it mentions fragrance a couple of times. How does that fit into this, uh, this triumphal procession? Well, the, the other thing that would go on is that the priests would be walking along with their censers filled with incense, and uh, they would be uh, swinging them so that the whole area would have this fragrance of uh, this incense. But he talks about how this aroma means two different things to people. Here's what it means. So they're going along, there is this fragrance, and the victorious soldiers and the general would see that aroma as a fragrance of victory. But at the very same time, the captives who were on their way to the arena and likely death would see that, would, would smell that same aroma, and to them it would be the fragrance of death. Same aroma, but with two very different meanings. So Paul is saying this when we when we share the gospel. For those who trust in, in Christ, we share the gospel with them and we're the fragrance of life. It's a very positive and very wonderful thing. But you share the gospel, the very same message, in the very same way with one who rejects Christ, has no interest in God, and it be, that, that same message becomes the fragrance of of death, the smell of death. Now, who, who can handle that? Who's up to that? I recall uh, in one of our trips to England, we were staying with a, a church planter there and visiting them to encourage them and counsel with them and, and so on. And we had the opportunity to, to meet uh, their neighbor lady that uh, they had gotten to know. Here's how he introduced me, and here was her response. He said, this is uh, Connie and Dale Weldon. They're from the United States, and Dale is a pastor. Without, it, without any kind of greeting, without any kind of a, a hello, uh, she said this. These were the first words out of her mouth. Oh, so I guess you're here to, to try to save me, huh? Now, my response to her, I was taken back a little bit, but my response was, well, I can't really save you, but I'd be happy to talk to you about Jesus. But we shouldn't be surprised when, when that becomes the response of someone who has no interest in Christ. They don't want to hear about it. And so they not only don't like the message, they're not necessarily going to like you as well. We will not be well received by those who reject Christ. So this task before us is also way too much because uh, the issues that we're dealing with uh, have such high stakes it's the highest possible stakes. It's life or death, and it's eternal life or eternal punishment. I've had times in my ministry when uh, I have preached on a Sunday morning and there was someone in the congregation that morning that before the next Sunday they had died, either died suddenly or been killed in a car uh, wreck or something like that. Now, if you knew that, if you knew when you were talking to somebody that that, that was a possibility, which by the way, it always is, but if you were conscious of that, how urgent would be your message? What would you say to them? Not only is it, is it urgent and it's 
Uh, the stakes are so high, but the message is way too big for us. Who can, who can express, who can explain these great doctrines that God has revealed to us? Who can explain the incarnation, God becoming flesh? Who can explain the, the Trinity, one God in three persons? Who can explain suffering? Who can explain how Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then there was no apparent answer. Who can explain those things? And not only that, how can you explain to someone else that God has changed you? That God has forgiven you? That he has freed you from the guilt of your sin? That he has given you grace to deal with very, very difficult situations? That he's always with you? Or that he's given you faith to believe that the Bible is God's word. How can you explain that to someone else? The message is too big for us. So not only is the task before us too daunting, but in addition, here's the big challenge. We, we see that it's way beyond our ability, but believers who are called to share that message are all disqualified. We're disqualified. If you've been in ministry for uh, any length of time, uh, like I have, I've known a, a number of pastors who have fallen into sin. Addictions from pornography to painkillers to alcohol, fallen into adultery, abuse. But there's another temptation, even, even beyond those kinds of, of very public sins. And that temptation uh, I, I face and I have to deal with a tendency because I've been preaching almost four decades. Here's the problem with that. Because I have prepared messages and preached messages virtually every week for that long, I can actually prepare a message and preach it without God. Now that frightens me. I don't ever want to do that. But I could go through the mechanics and do all of those kinds of things. And that's why I need these reminders. That when there's too much of me, it doesn't leave room for him to be glorified. I know a pastor in uh, Pakistan that I stayed with him and his family when I was over there. And uh, he is a Pakistani. And he was asked to come to a church planting conference here in the United States that was taking place. And he uh, told me uh, this story of what took place. He said all these young, uh, attractive uh, intelligent pastors uh, stood up and they talked about all the great things that were going on in their church and the, the innovations they, that they had done and uh, the, the, how fast their church was growing and that kind of thing. And then uh, he got up and uh, I do believe he's, he's got the, the gift of a prophetic voice. But what he said when he got up was, I am amazed at how much American pastors can do without God. Now, was that an overstatement? 
maybe. But it's a reminder that we all have to be reminded of and learn again and again. And the lesson is this. I can't do those things, but He can. I can't. It's too big for me. It's too vast for me. Too much at stake for me. But He can. Paul had a way of saying that, and you know this series is called uh, Sufficient. It was based on this and other passages, but we'll get to 2 Corinthians 12 later. But here's how he put it. He said in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he says, therefore I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Not his own sufficiency, but that of Christ. And that leads us to to the second major thing we, we see here. Paul felt weak. He still ministered. Because there is another sufficiency, and it's Christ. There is another competency, and it comes from Christ. So back in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 2. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. So here we are back at the the triumphal procession. But the picture that Paul is, is presenting is not of Paul in this chariot in a triumphal procession, although uh, his missionary journeys, there were many triumphal things that took place, and, and no one would deny that, that many things took place because of uh, his ministry that God had called him to. But that's not the picture he's giving. He's not the one in the chariot, but Christ is. He is the captive of Christ, chained to his chariot, as it were, while Christ rides in triumph. And that must be the picture that we have of our ministry, our walk with Christ as we labor in the kingdom. I have many times uh, used the account of of Jim Elliot, who was uh, a, a missionary to the Alka Indians, and he was martyred when he was trying to reach them. And, and his story has been told and, and retold. If you're part of our congregation, you've heard me talk about Jim Elliott and many of the quotes that, that he made, his journals and all of those kinds of things. And many have been inspired in the ministry and uh, to go to the mission field because of Jim Elliott and his brief ministry. But most of us have never heard of Bert Elliott. Bert was Jim Elliott's brother. Bert and his wife Colleen ministered in Peru from 1949 until his death in 2012. Now during that time, he and his wife planted some 170 churches. He never thought about retirement. He was always available for the people that God had called him to. But most have never even heard his name. In reflecting about his brother, 
Bert said this, Jim and I both served Christ, but differently. Jim was a great meteor streaking through the sky. Now, Bert didn't go on to describe his ministry, but Randy Alcorn in an article did. He said this, unlike his brother Jim, the shooting star, Bert was a faint star that rose night after night, faithfully crossing the same path in the sky to God's glory. You get it? We wouldn't have known his name. But he, like that faint star that nobody is in awe of, nobody even maybe notices, he brought God glory throughout his ministry. Here's the point. We don't need to be a meteor streaking across the sky. Be content with where God calls us. And if, if that is to be a faint star in the night sky crossing the same path every night, if that's what he calls us to, then be content in that. Because that too is for God's glory. And rejoice that he can use us. And even in that, we are a part of that triumphal procession. That must be the picture as we labor in the kingdom. We must resist the temptation to think that, that we can crawl into the chariot with Christ and, and share his glory, share his accolades. If there is a victory, if there is any competency, it is his. Who is sufficient for such a task? He is. Christ is. Let's bow together. So Lord, as we bow, will you give us that very real sense that when we are overwhelmed by what you have called us to do, overwhelmed by whatever uh, difficulty we have in our life, whatever challenge, whatever glorious thing, that the, the answer is, I can't, but he can. I can't, but Christ in me can. We thank you for that. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. As we respond to God's word, let's sing together, lift high the name of Jesus.
What joy and what a joy for you to have joined us today. We are so thankful that you were with us. Remember, this is temporary. We will be back together again. And so, children of the living God, will you reach out and receive the Lord's benediction? Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And God's people said, Amen. <laughs>